All right, let's go ahead and look at some of the information necessary to complete the module folder 1C pre-lab for forces. This one has a simulation again. Uh, if you watch the previous videos, I have mentioned the little robot or mannequin guy. I don't know what to call him, um, but he is going to help us out today. So if we look, um, we do want to pay attention. Be careful not to skip this or you're going to get stuck and this isn't going to make sense. We are dealing with the acceleration portion of the simulation. So here you've got multiple options. Now it's not a big deal. Let's say you accidentally clicked on this one and you know the things don't look right. We don't have all the same information here. You can go across the bottom and still switch. Okay, then we want to basically go in and turn on a bunch of settings and <coughs> excuse me, uh, make sure that the lab's gonna work properly for the next section. So to have as much information as possible and to be able to see some of the changes as they happen, we basically just turn on everything. Then to be consistent, we're gonna turn the friction all the way up because if we leave it as default and put it in the middle, if you accidentally ever bump this, you don't know where to put it anymore. But if it was always all the way up, then that makes it easier to, to sort of normalize and, and set the same as everybody else. Okay, uh, and this is a little robot guy that we're going to use. Um, we can drag him around to make him push certain ways, or we can set his, his forces certain values and then, you know, see what's going to happen. All right, so I'm going to zero him out. Then I want to pause. I should have done that a minute ago, but I stopped him again, so it's fine. Um, but I want to leave him paused because some of our answers are, are very difficult or possibly um, not able to be gotten if he's able to move. Okay, so if we look through the questions, um, essentially what we're trying to do is we eventually want to calculate the um, coefficient of friction between this box or crate and the, uh, the surface here, the ground. So we can see, you know, by using the robot and, and pushing and, and pulling and moving stuff around, how that's going to work. One thing you do need to know about this particular simulation, um, I suppose to make numbers easier or maybe to program things more easily, they do assume that we're on a, a ideal perfect planet where gravity is exactly 10. So in lecture and in other assignments, we use 9.8 .8 meters per second squared for gravity, um, but I believe they use 10. Okay, so with our first question, it's asking about the weight of the crate. And you do need to be careful here because this is something that people say incorrectly in, in standard conversation. Um, weight cannot be measured in kilograms. Those are mass numbers. It, there's even the clue here, and people skip this, um, that you need to use 10 meters per second squared for gravity. So the mass of the crate is 50 kilograms. And then multiplying that by 10 meters per second squared, 50 times 10 um, is 500. Then kilograms times meters per second squared turns into newtons. That is an actual measure of weight. Newtons and pounds um, are, are actual weight. We just don't use pounds in the simulations. Okay, now that's going to give the weight of the crate. And what we want to keep in mind, um, let's say that we draw, I'll pretend it was a little bit straighter than that, but let's say we draw a surface and we have a box here then the weight acting on this box is going to be coming down. So we decided that the weight here was 500 newtons. If that were the only force, or if this force was too much, then whatever the surface would be would break and everything would fall down. But we can see in the simulation that obviously just sitting here, and we wouldn't expect the actual ground to break under normal circumstances. So what's going to happen, and this is part of the next question, is that there has to be a supporting force going back up for the basically the ground not breaking. We call this normal force, usually F for force and capital N for normal. Now, this is gonna have to be equal and opposite to the weight that's coming down. Imagine the normal force was somehow 600 instead of 500. That would mean that somehow this is gonna be launched into the air. Or if the maximum normal force is somehow less than 500, then this would break and all fall down and that would be a different sort of question. Okay, so um, this is an equal and opposite thing. We didn't need to calculate anything new. If there's 500 newtons of weight going down, there has to be 500 newtons of normal force going back up. Okay, and then net force means that you look at any forces that are gonna interact with each other and you see if they're gonna add together or work against each other and subtract or what they're going to do. 
And then I think it makes sense um, if you've got 500 going up and 500 coming down, that if we were to set those and, and see how they interact with each other, um, typically we take things that are going down and give them negative signs once we start doing math. So we would essentially have 500 minus 500. There's another clue. Um, it doesn't put units on this part, but it says sum of forces equals zero. So you can read this technically from the simulation, or you can do 500 minus 500. But our net force, and this is always going to be true, if something's just resting, it's not moving at all, net force has to be zero. OK, then what's going to happen? Um, we want to try to make the robot push on this box. And then we want to use that to estimate what friction is. So friction is not something that you can measure directly. Um, it's also variable up to a certain point. Because here, if I make the robot push with 50 newtons of force, then there's going to be 50 newtons of friction to cancel him out. And if I make him push with 100, then he's canceled with 100 and 150, 200, 250. Now, finally, at 300, something different happens. So no matter what I do, I can't make my red arrow go above a certain number. And as it turns out, that's the maximum friction force. Um, and in fact, that's the number that we need to break to make this start to move. So if I were to match 250 and 250 and let this play, nothing's actually going to happen. Technically, the robot's not pushing quite hard enough to beat friction. It's just matching friction, and so it's still a dead heat. Um, so we're going to pause this again so I don't accidentally break it later. Um, but if we look and read the question again, maximum static friction force, static meaning it's stationary, still resting. Um, then that's going to be 250. And again, the clue here, what's the highest force before the robot wins? We saw if we put even one extra, this is locked to 250 because that's the maximum. This is a little extra, and then that's going to do something we'll look at later. In this scenario, we have 250 newtons of friction and 250 newtons of force from the robot. So again, we can see either from reading the, the simulation, or if we did the math, 250 forward minus 250 backwards, we'd have a zero newton net force. If it's resting, if it hasn't moved at all, the net force is going to have to be zero. OK, um, then that's actually going to help us to do something here. So we have learned a formula, and it's on the formula sheet if you haven't seen it yet. But we have that the force of friction is equal to mu, which is a Greek letter multiplied by normal force. So um, and actually, I can add to my, my picture a little bit, too. So to copy what we have in the simulation, right? so our applied force, so to match that, I'm going to say FA for short. Applied force was 250 newtons. And then that's being canceled by friction. So backwards, we'd have uh, force of friction make this a little smaller so it'll fit 500 newtons okay so from this formula uh, we are looking for mu so in lecture we were always given a value for mu but in lab we're going to try to work and eventually see if we can find that mu is being multiplied by normal force which we don't want to be there and so if we divide the normal force and bring that over that's going to cancel here and rearrange this formula and that's going to tell us that mu is equal to the force of friction divided by normal force, which is actually kind of nice because we have numbers for those things. So the force of friction, what we got from here, and when I copied over onto this diagram, um, oh, I made a mistake, didn't I? Uh, easy fix, though. Got carried away on my number and looked at the wrong column. So in fact, I'll make this green so that it stands out. So fix that if you wrote down what I wrote down. Um, minor mistake, but easy fix. Our force of friction is 250, now that it's the correct value. Um, then dividing by the normal force, again, that's the portion that goes up, is 500. Now, this gives you a good idea of what friction is actually doing, what this coefficient means. It takes a portion of your normal force and turns it into friction force. And these numbers are reasonably clean that you might even be able to just kind of look at it and see what the value is. But if you run this through a calculator, you get a half. So a half of our normal force turns into friction. Now, I'm going to write this with some extra zeros on it because I know there are extra decimal places on the answer key. All right, so we got 0 0.500. OK, 
so now we want to make something new happen. We want to maximize the force coming from the robot. So this would be similar to if the robot ran up and just like hit this real hard. Um, and then, you know, the instant before the block starts to move, there's a whole bunch of extra force. And then what's going to happen um, if you can beat friction, then this thing will start to slide. So just before, again, I've made this mistake before and had to start over. Make sure the simulation is still paused um, and then determine the net force. So again, this is the instant before it starts to move. Now, because there's extra force here and less friction um, comparable to it, that there is leftover force, the sum of the forces here is going to allow motion. So the difference in those is 250. Okay, so now we want to let things move and we're going to see what changes. So it says unpause and repause the simulation. So, you know, I'll let it run for a little bit. Can't let it run too long because it breaks things. But see, speed's going up. There's acceleration. Uh, the sum of the forces is a different number. The friction's a different number. This is still 500, so pay attention to that. Um, but several things did change once this started to move. And what happens is your static friction was a higher number, right? Static friction force when this thing was stationary was 250. Now that it's kinetic, which for us means sliding, this is now 188. So it is, in fact, a smaller number. So let's go read the answer choice. Okay, sometimes I word this differently. Um, a lot of times in, in lecture, I'll say that kinetic friction is always smaller or lower than static friction, but that's the same thing just sort of reversed around. So be careful on the direction and how it's described, but static friction is higher. It's the idea that it's harder to make something start to move than it is to keep it moving. Okay, then now I want to work backwards a little bit and I want to, to make this have a zero Newton net force. Well, right now it's got a big net force, 300 extra Newtons of force from the robot. So let's turn this down a bit. One, two, three, four, five, six. So six ticks brought that down by 300 Newtons, but that was a slightly estimated number. Notice that there's still some force left over. So even though it's not much, if I let this play out, tiny acceleration, speed's still going up. So that's not completely balanced. If you think about it, though, I think you could come up with it. If there's 188 newtons of friction, we need 188 newtons to cancel that. And so notice now there's no acceleration because there's no net force and there's nothing to make it go faster. It's in perfect balance. If we turn the robot down a little bit, then actually he's going to slow down. There's negative acceleration. And then if we leave it balanced, it would go the same speed forever. This would be similar to setting a cruise control in your vehicle. doesn't mean that there are no forces, but for any forces that exist, they're equal and opposite, and something cancels it. So your engine will, you know, your vehicle will drive forward as hard as it needs to to work against the friction and wind resistance and whatever else to continue going the same speed. Okay, so what was that number? Um, the robot, once we... Oh, I accidentally skipped one. I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, it's here. I just failed to read the second time. Um, determine the force the robot can, um, creates a zero Newton net force. So we saw that, right? 188 compared to 188, they cancel. Okay, and then final question. Um, we want to confirm. So kinetic friction, we said earlier that kinetic friction had to be smaller. Technically, that's the only answer choice that's smaller. Um, but let's run through and see if we can check this. Let's see the things we need to change and hopefully not mess up any numbers this time. Um, so the applied force is different. It's the same crate, so the weight and the normal force won't be different from here. So that means that I can save a little bit of this and not have to write quite so much. Um, let's do a new color, maybe orange this time. So the applied force, 188 for 188 friction. So we've got 188 in both directions. All right, 188 newtons. And then here, 188 and a tiny n for newtons because it didn't have a lot of space. Okay. So then we would plug in here 188 newtons. Newtons and newtons cancel. Um, as you can see from the choices, we are not meant to have any units on this. These are all just decimal numbers. And then if we go and take these two numbers and divide them, uh, we get 0 0.376. So the fact that this one had decimal places is why we had decimal places set to the other one, even though it could have just been 0 0.5.
Um, not really looking at significant digits on this, just wanting to round out and, and find a value. Okay, and that's it. Um, also, I want to show you one of the reasons we were being so careful earlier is that if we overtax the robot, uh, eventually he gives up, um, and then you know the box goes loose and he gets left behind. So it's not very nice. So we don't do that during the the main part of the lab. Okay, uh, well that should be everything we need. So that's it.